Hello, everybody out there in the internet, as well as all of our guests here in person. I'm Gareth Kalfas. I am the missioner for Camp and Retreat Ministries in the Diocese of Southern Virginia. And we are here live at Spring at EYC weekend and also broadcasting out uh, across the diocese and across the internet. This is a special program with two very special guests. We're going to hear from Nellie Adkins, my good friend, and Chief Kevin Brown, retired chief of the Pamunkey tribe, who have a ton of wealth of knowledge to share with us. This program is brought to you by the Diocesan Repairers of the Breach. And without any further ado, I'll turn it over to them. At the end of the program, we'll open it up to questions both from our live in-person audience as well as from the people out on the Zoom world. Thank you so much for being in attendance. I'm Kevin Brown. I'm from the Pamunkey Indian Reservation, and I'm the former chief of the tribe. I, live, um, I moved to the reservation in 1972. I think I was... Uh, 17 years old and been there ever since and I uh, worked with Nelly before a few years back with the diocese I've uh, been to some meetings up in DC and, and worked with a group of uh, volunteers that came to the reservation and helped us do some landscaping and fix up uh, one of our, our buildings out there and so we've had a long long relationship and, and Nelly invited me to come here for this this talk today no. Uh, Wingapo Naptapiwa, greetings to you all, my relatives, because we are all related. Um, and so we speak our language here at home when we can, uh, what we have left. But I'm um, Chickahominy. I uh, currently live in Middletown, Virginia, which is in the Blue Ridge, Blue Ridge Mountains of Virginia. I live on the North Fork of the Shendor River. They wrote songs about that place. But uh, anyway, um, glad to be here. We really appreciate you guys having us. And it's a great audience, all these young, promising, excellent faces. So anyway, we're just really honored and delighted uh, to be here and to talk with you, um, especially to speak into the lives of these young people who are with us and hopefully impassion their lives to grow and grow strong and do the things that need to be done for our people, all of our people. Um, we all live here. We all share this place. Um, so anyway, Kevin and I want to kind of talked with you a little bit uh, tonight about Virginia Indians yesterday and today. Um, just briefly, it's really cool to think about the fact that this Chanco Conference Center sits on the site of Quinga Yohannik, and Quinga Yohannik was the place that they brought John Smith, uh, where he watched the bus run. Uh, in our language, we call that Huskanon, which is a rite of passage. It's when young men pass from the pubescent age into manhood and take on the responsibilities of men, take on the responsibilities of warriors. And so Powhatan, Werewahunsakuk, uh, Werewahamakamako Powhatan, the father of Pocahontas Matoka, um, had this as a, a place where young men would come to train as warriors. And it wasn't just, you know, like a three month marine boot camp. It was, it, it lasted for quite a while. Um, kind of like Swiss Army, two, three year um, commitment where you came in and you learned how to be a warrior. And if you didn't run, you learned how to run because uh, people said, did your people have horses back in those days? You know, and we said, no, you'd be decapitated when you left the encampment because all the trees and the, and the limbs would take your head right off. So no, nobody was on a horse that had a brain. They would be running and they learned to be swift and fleet for the power. Of course, they went from native town to native town taking messages. And that's how the messages got transferred quite quickly. Uh, you'd be surprised how fast uh, a trained runner can run. Um, and so anyway, that's kind of how that, that happened. But it started here. They brought Smith here. Um, he thought he was going to be uh, killed, beheaded. I don't know what he thought. It was actually an honoring to bring him into um, liaisonship an alliance ship with the Powhatan. So they brought him here and then they had um, his daughter to do kind of a, a, an adoption ceremony which kind of made like he was being killed and she, you know, saved him, that kind of thing. And that, that happened like right here. So I think it's cool to, to know that you're on sacred ground basically. Uh, where, you know, the Huskanon was done. That was a very sacred rite of passage. And then you had a historical moment with John Smith, you know, that happened here. So it goes back a long time. So I want to bring that up. And then um, what do you want to talk about first as far as 
And so we were at war with, with other tribes out west when the English first came here. So we were basically f fighting a war on, on two fronts. And then and Powhatan was also fighting against the um, uh, Chesapeake Indians down in Chesapeake. And so there's a lot going on in 1607 when the, the English first came here. And, and plus the, the Spanish came here in the late 1500s. And that's when, and they brought, um, they brought smallpox and they brought disease. And it took a while f for them to get around. So when the, when the English came in 1607, we were already, our numbers are, had already been decimated. And, and a lot of people had died from the, um, from the different um, viruses or bugs that we got from the, the Spanish explorers. And plus there was a drought. They said it was like a, f a three or four year drought at that time. And so uh, food supplies were down. And so a lot of people wonder how could the English have come here and just you know, taken over. But there's a lot of different factors. You know, we were, our numbers were down and we weren't healthy and our food supplies were down. And so we were fighting a lot of battles and that's kind of how things kind of you know, progressed like that and kind of deteriorated for us. So um, one of the things when we talked about things we wanted to share with you were some things that we are not and some things that we are. Um, it's kind of what I call dispelling mythology, all right? So um, people always say uh, to both of us, I'm quite sure we've heard this a thousand billion times, uh, you live in a DP, and I'm like, I'm not a Lakota. What are, you, what are you looking for here? They're the folks that live in teepees sometimes, especially powwows. But no, nobody lives in a teepee unless they're a hippie anymore. I mean, you know, it's just, it's just not happening, all right? But we did never live in teepees. We lived in longhouses that in our language we called yahigan, okay, yahigan. And then we also had individual houses that are sort of like what you would call a wigwam. We had yahigans that were winter set, and then we had yahigans that were summer set. Some of you who have had the privilege of being out in, in the tent cities, so to speak, this, this weekend, um, you know, it can, it can get really warm in there at night where you, you think it might be cooler, but the humidity of the day is still in that tent. And so you're just kind of like, well, man, I'm sweating. You know, I can't get over this stuff. And so that could happen in a yahigan. So you would do things like weave mats, large mats or large plaques out of cattail mats or other kind of fibrous things. And you would take down bark, sheets of bark that were covering the sides of this apartment building, a.k.a. a longhouse, a.k.a. a yahigan. And you would substitute those bark pieces for these mats that what allowed for air filtration okay and so it was you did whatever you had to do you know in order to make it commodious to your lifestyle um another thing that um you know we did and and still do we have the tradition of the three sisters garden all right that's part of our heritage. People say, well, that's Haudenosaunee Iroquois. Well, yes, because they're Eastern people. We've all shared many commonalities. But um, that's been one of the things that we've done for forever. Um, and I, w I would have to say the river is the big player in every part of our life for the, the special vats of clay that we dig to traditionally make our traditional pots that we've been making, that we still make. Um, we have a women's pottery guild, but you know the men also did pottery. They're probably some of the best pottery makers. Um, someone very close by me is an amazing pottery artist, artisan, sculptor, everything you could think of. He's a musician. I mean, there's nothing he can't do because he's so brainy and smart. But we just had all of this wonderful, all these wonderful things that were tied into the river. And, well, no, we didn't have interstates. Hello, we had rivers. The river is your interstate. The river is many things. You plan to get something to drink, something fresh and delicious, it's right there. You want to take care of that Three Sisters garden, you want to help it to grow, your river is right there. Um, the river is medicine, a lot of medicine plants right there in the river still today, still medicine plants. I mean, you name it. Sweet flag is, is 
is is is the main one. That's holy plant. Yeah. Um, you want to talk about Frank's back? Uh, yeah, and I want you to start off with that. First, okay. We should probably say. I'm sorry. The Powhatan Confederacy was hit with good and bad. Um, right around the same time frame of, of people being in our lives, being catapulted into our lives, being foisted upon us, okay? Um, but we had a guy who was um, uh, a, real, a real wacko crazy person. And his name was Dr. Walter Plecker. And Dr. Walter Plecker was, God forbid, an MD. And he was the head of the Bureau of Vital Statistics in the state of Virginia. And he did not like Indian people at all. I mean, he had had some kind of a run-in in college with some young uh, Chelagi woman, I think. And um, he wanted her to go out and have dinner, and she was like, mm, not tonight, big boy. I'm, you know, I'm not into all that. And so he was just like, how dare you? So after that, he, he developed this, this nastiness about anybody that was Native. I mean, how do you transfer that kind of stuff? They have hospitals for people like that. But he was a doctor, so you know, he, didn't, he didn't go to a hospital. He worked in one. And so basically, he, by hook or by crook, he becomes the head of vital statistics. Well, these are the people that control birth certificates and marriage certificates and death certificates. And in those days, you put your race on those certificates. So if he didn't like what you put on the certificate, this man had no life. He must have never gone home. They probably didn't want him to come home. But anyway, he would get these certificates, and he would mark out if somebody put native. Now, we have him and his rule and reign for forever over here on this side. On the other side, we have Frank Speck, who is an ethnologist, anthropologist from the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia, who was a friend and a proponent, not only of our people in the Powhatan Confederacy, but up the East Coast with all Native and Indigenous groups. Uh, I know the Catawba were, were one of the big groups in South Carolina that he ha had a, a particular penchant for. But um, I want Kevin to kind of talk a little more about Frank Speck because he was wonderful. Yeah, um, Dr. Speck wrote a book. It's called The Powhatan Tribes, and um, you can find it online. And there's a lot of great photographs in there um, that he took. When he, and he traveled around. And he stayed on the reservation, and he boarded, and he would, he'd be there for like two months each year, uh, writing and collecting. And he, he went around and bought a lot of pottery and beadwork and stuff like that. And now you can find that, uh, that pottery and beadwork in museums all around the country, because uh, he shared with uh, the Denver uh, Museum and uh, museums in Florida and, um, and Pennsylvania, too. So... Um, he preserved a lot of our culture, and he wrote about it in the 1920s. And he actually tried to encourage the Powhatan tribes to reform the Confederacy that had dissolved around uh, 1644. And so um, there was an attempt to revise the, uh, the Confederacy, but it didn't, it, it didn't work because too many politics were, were going on at the time. But um, he just did some great work, uh, some great anthropological work. You know, if you want to read about that, you have to um, uh, start with Frank Speck and uh, the Bureau of Ethnology, and you can find his stuff online. Mm -hmm. so, but he, he, he helped us uh, keep our identity uh, while Plecker was trying to take our identity away. So. He was an amazing, amazing guy. Um, he encouraged people. You know, um, my mom said that her grandmother, my great-grandmother, she would say, Cora, come in here and I want you to recite a certain piece for me. You know, she learned a lot of recitations and um, she's really good at it. So, of course, her grandmother wanted to kind of pull that out of her. And she would say, come on, recite that. And mom would say, oh, I forgot that, Grandma. And she said, honey, you never forget anything. She said, it's in there. She said, stand up there and stay for me. And of course, it would come out. My mom would remember. But you have no idea what's in your mind. You have no idea what's in your brain. You may think that you don't remember that. 
But, you know, I mean, we had to memorize Gettysburg Address when I was in fourth grade. And I found myself one day going, four score and seven years ago. So, you know, we did. I was like, oh, my golly, Ned, I didn't think I remember that. But see, I never forgot it. And so basically what Frank Speck did and what Frank Speck brought to the table was a way of bringing remembrance out of the people for things that they had known, that they had been taught as kids, that they had seen, that they had witnessed. And he kind of was like a catalyst for that memory to come forth. And so a lot of traditional kinds of things like feather making and, and um, making like clothing with feathers, that type of thing, he brought that out and the people really began to bring back. It was like a renaissance. He, he was able to pull that out of them and encourage them. And rather than, you know, dumbing them down, like Speck was always out there trying to make them feel less than, um, Plecker. Speck, <clears throat> Speck was bringing out the good stuff. He was encouraging them. <clears throat> I'm sorry. And he was doing an amazing job. So the people were really, they were really excited about it. And then um, I think that the political things that came in that prevented that vision from being fully birthed was an outside political force. Um, who knows, Walter Plecker was probably behind it because he had a lot of people in his back pocket. Um, he also, by the way, later became an ardent admirer of one of our not favorite people, Adolf Hitler. So I think that begins to tell you exactly what kind of a person he was and what kind of person he was not. He was despicable, for lack of a better term. So that was what the tribes were foisted with. Um, and yet Frank Speck encouraged and lifted up um, our people particularly. And he saw the benefit and the beauty of putting the Powhatan Confederacy back together again as it was in its zenith because he knew that it was unlimited that way. Um, it's kind of like um, I think the, the Haudenosaunee have a saying about what are what is one chord standing alone where you bind three chords together you have strength you have strength and that's what spec was all about strength in the whole the wholeness um but one standing alone can only stand for so long so i want to talk about federal recognition the um A lot of people ask me what I did when I was chief, but uh, 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 the thing I did the most was work on, on, on trying to get my tribe federal recognition. And uh, we went through uh, the Bureau of Indian Affairs. Uh, there's actually four different ways you can get recognition. You can get it from an executive order. Or the president could just do it. But the last president that did that was um, uh, uh, Teddy Roosevelt. And so uh, the, uh, the presidents don't want to do that. But then you can go through Congress, and that's what some of the Virginia tribes did. That's what the Chickahominy did, Eastern Chickahominy, Monacan, uh, Rappahannock, and Upper Mattapanai. They went through Congress, and they, and they had a bill go through Congress, and it was signed by the president, but um, uh, that's called the um, legislative way to get uh, recognition. We went through the Office of Federal Acknowledgement, which is the administrative way, through the Bureau of Indian Affairs. And we had to uh, compile a history of the tribe and turn all our documentation in. And, and the documentation uh, we had when we took up to DC, it took two vans, two cargo vans to take it all the way up there because there was just so much material. And if you, if you put a footnote in the, in, the, in the narration and you mentioned a book, you had to provide that book, the whole book. So they didn't want to get up from their desk and go to the library and look it up. They just wanted to look in the box and get it. So we had to buy all these books and have them all Xeroxed and, and turn that in along with it. That's, that's, that's why it took so much, uh, uh, so much space and so much time to put everything together. But we had to trace our tribe back to uh, the late 1700s. And each person on the reservation had to have their genealogy traced all the way back to the 1700s. And we have like 
uh, 12 um, historic members that everyone has to um, descend from, and they're called base role members. So we all descend from uh, 12 people basically on the reservation. And so we did it. It took us uh, 20 years. It took a little bit longer than the, uh, the bill of Congress, but um, we don't have any restrictions. Uh, there's some restrictions on the other tribes that they can't do, but we don't have those restrictions. But um, uh, that's how we got recognition. And it, it means to a tribe, um, it just opens doors for uh, f federal grants and monies and housing monies, and you can go right, th uh, right to HUD. You don't have to go through your state HUD office. We can go directly to the, the HUD office in, in D.C. And um, even on a, on a federal reservation, you can, um, uh, the chief can uh, declare a state of emergency and doesn't have to uh, wait for the governor so if a, if a storm hits the reservation, the chief can go directly to the federal government and get f uh, FEMA monies. You don't have to go through the state. So there's a lot of uh, things that uh, the federal recognition empowers tribes. And any business on the reservation is, is tax exempt. You don't, you don't have to pay any state tax. And, and um, um, also, like, we don't have to get uh, building permits and things like that. So there's a lot of, um, a lot of, industry that wants to partner with tribes now and 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 do factories on reservations because they can build them quicker because they don't have to wait for building permits and inspections and they can just you know put it up according to the tribe standards and then they can get it in operation a lot quicker that way and, and save money there's a lot of uh, conferences that try to bring um, industry and and and, f and federal tribes together because they can partner together and and uh, the tribe can uh, benefit uh, from jobs, and the corporation can benefit from tax breaks, things like that. So native business is a big, is a big thing right now. There's a casino that's supposed to be built in Norfolk. Um, uh, the tribe's just waiting for the, um, all the permits to go through and things like that. So, so one day that'll, uh, hopefully that'll be up, and uh, there'll be benef educational benefits for tribal members and, and housing and. And, and that takes a burden off the federal government. That's why, that's why the federal government likes it w when tribes have casinos, because then they can, they can cut back on the, on the federal funding. You know? so, and so that's in the framework. Yeah. Um, OK, so how about some of the things that in the past, and some are going on right now and into the future, but things that have kept us together, like things that we have really enjoyed and, and have made us stay even though we're not 30 some groups of folks anymore, we're more like eight-ish. But um, what are some things that you have, memories from your boyhood and, and things that you've treasured? So what do you want to share about that? Because that's real important. Um, all, the, all the Powhatan tribes, we all had um, what they called a uh, track meeting or, or homecoming. And um, it's some, I don't know when it happened, but uh, uh, the first missionaries that, uh, that came to the, uh, the reservations were Episcopal, but then it, uh, they turned uh, Baptist. And so each, each tribe has a Baptist church either on its reservation or, or in its territory. And um, every year there'd be what they called homecoming. And, and that's how the tribes kept together. The tribes would go to each other's homecoming, and they're always on a different weekend. So that, you know, they'd never, uh, there was no conflict. So Chickahominies would come to Pamunkey, and Pamunkey would go to Chickahominy and Rappahannock. And that's how we kept together socially. And, um, and in a way, that kind of kept the, uh, the Confeder uh, Confederacy together. And uh, that's how we shared a lot of uh, uh, cultural stories and things like that. And then a lot of people in the 50s, we were sent out to Oklahoma and Kansas to go to high school because you couldn't go to high school in Virginia if you were if you were native, or if you lived on the reservation, because you didn't pay taxes. And so the you know, school system is based on where you live and where you pay taxes. But we, we didn't pay taxes, so they wouldn't let us go to school. And so we had to go out to Oklahoma. So. And this is before Brown versus the Board of Education. And so uh, basically, there were only two groups of people, and we didn't fit. And so they said, well, we can't really do anything for you. 
Um, and so they did give us a token at Pamunkey where um, you could go to school through sixth grade or seventh grade? I think sixth grade. Okay. Yeah, sixth grade. And, and then um, they said, well, you can go help your daddy on the farm. You know, you can go do that. And so um, parents that said, I want more for my child than this, then they had to pack little Albert or little Minnie up at that age and send them. Uh, Bacon College was Bacon Prep School, Bacon High School, which is in Muskogee, Oklahoma. So a, a bunch of our families went there. A lot of Chickahominies went there. And then um, a lot of them went out to Haskell, which is an Indian school in Kansas. Um, and a couple of them went up to Cherokee High School, which is in um, Okanalufti which is on the Eastern Band Res in um, Western North Carolina. But um, can you imagine the trauma of most young people? I mean, they might have said, yeah, I, I could take a break from mom and dad occasionally, but they, they, they still really care about their family, and there's a lot that they have vested in that. Um, to be so young and to go live in a, a boarding school with people you don't know, um, and of course, more other Native people were very loving and caring, but it was still a foreign, a foreign country for our kids. But a lot of them knew that's the only way they would get what they could get. And then they would go on, like a lot of them that were at Bacon, then they would go to um, Oklahoma University and they'd get a degree, um, or Eastern Oklahoma University at Ada. And they'd go there to school and then they'd come home and they would come teachers in Indian schools that the tribes started and that the tribes fostered because the state was still saying um, you know, before this Brown versus Board of Education, well, we don't owe you anything, you know, you wanna sign a paper and you know, decide you wanna change race, we might be able to fit you in. And we were like, why can't we just be who we were? We, you know, we've always been who we are. We let you in here in the first place. So I mean, it was just always just really, really nasty and really ugly and um, and that went on, that, uh, and it kept going on through the 50s. And, and Charles City County was one of the last holdouts, um, along with Warren County in uh, Western Virginia, where they, they just, they would not break down and let everybody come to school that wanted to come to school. I mean, they just kept throwing up these ridiculous l rules and laws that they made on their own. We never mentioned the tribute. Um, I guess you can, um, every year at Thanksgiving, uh, you've probably seen the Pamunkey and Mattapanai tribe uh, take a tribute to the governor. And that was uh, written up in the treaty, um, actually the uh, treaty of uh, 1646. And we used to take 21 beaver skins and give it to the governor of Virginia. But then after beaver got scarce, um, it was changed to any tribute of, of wild game. And so we take either a deer or a wild turkey up to the governor every year. And that's actually to pay our taxes. And it, um, it, was, it was a tribute back from colonial times. And, um, and we still do it today. And the other tribes are getting involved too now. Uh, the other um, uh, Powhatan tribes that just because they weren't on the reservation, they weren't doing it. But now they're, they're back sharing it with us and we're all doing it together now um, at the governor each year. And that's... Um, and that's still going on, even though we're, even though we're federally recognized, we still uh, honor the treaty we have with Virginia. So, and you want to talk about the what? Oh, the dog mark. Okay. Well, uh, one of the other traditions in Virginia that uh, the Virginia tribes have is called the Fredericksburg Dog Mark, and it goes back to colonial times. And uh, we, it used to be a, uh, there was an outpost there, a trading post, and uh, we would take dogs because. Uh, the Powhatan people had dogs, wild dogs that we had tamed, and 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 the English had their dogs, and so there was a trading, and we trade uh, trade dogs and and trade pottery uh, for dogs, and they'd have, and now they have an auction. Um, well, they used to have an auction for dogs. Now that's it, it's an adoption that they have each year uh, for dogs in 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 Fredericksburg, and that goes that goes back to 1617, I think, or 1618, something like that. These are Potawomac people in Fredericksburg. White Oak people is what I grew up calling them, but they, they go by their, their other name, their traditional name, which is Potawomac. If you look at it, maybe you think it's 
a, a bastardization of Potomac, but it's Potowomac. These are the people that um, supposedly captured Pocahontas Matoka uh, and um, traded her to the English for a large copper pot and some things. Um, so they gave her over. That's when um, the pastor at Jamestown and his wife took her in, took care of her, and kept her for a couple of years. And then she met, um, or they introduced her to the Englishman planter, John Rolfe, uh, which is right down the road from here, where and they got married and and started their home, and then of course they they went to uh, to England, and uh, that wasn't a, a nice outcome. But anyway, um, you know that they're the the Potawomac people or the folks that were responsible for grabbing her in the first place. That's Wayne Newton's people. Oh yes. <laughs> but, um, but anybody have any questions now? Are we ready for questions? You mentioned that there were restrictions on other tribes that your tribe does not have. Can you clarify those restrictions? Well, the main one I'm talking about is, is casinos. Um, uh, Indian tribes uh, have, a, uh, have the right to uh, build and operate casinos on federal trust land. Um, that's not exactly what we're doing. Um, that's what we started out to do. But then Virginia changed this law, and and they legalized casinos. So uh, we just jumped in there as just like a regular casino company, and and just uh, put in a bid to build a casino in in Norfolk. But um, normally you do it on on a federal Indian reservation, even if it's illegal in the state, you can still do it because you're on um, sovereign land. But the other tribes. In their bill in Congress, there was language in there that said after they got federal recognition, they couldn't do casinos. Yeah, so that, that's the restrictions that, that they had on them and we didn't have on us. So, yeah. Um, anyone else? You meant, so you mentioned that, like, in, col in colonial times, the way, like, the, like, there would be a tribute of, like, hides and stuff to the governor. You said you still do that today. Do you still with like hides and stuff or is it with other things now uh, what we take usually is a deer i'll take a buck uh, we have a i think a deer hunting season in virginia be, opens up on a saturday but we don't um we don't hunt that saturday or sunday uh, we hunt on that monday because on wednesday we take the tribute uh to the governor and so whatever the largest buck we get on the reservation we take that up sometimes if we'll you know, if we scare up a wild turkey, you know, we'll shoot that too and, and take that. But it just went from the 21 beaver skins uh, to just a tribute of any wild game. And I've seen old, old pictures from the 20s when they, uh, they took rockfish up there. They'd have rockfish on a, on a pole. And, and, and there's a story that, um, that one year everybody was so busy they didn't, they didn't get any you know, any wild game, and, and they went up to the Virginia, um, the farmer's market there on 17th Street in Shaco Bottom, <laughs> and, and, and bought some ducks, and, and went around the corner, wrung their necks, and, and then tied them on a, on a pole and took it up to the governor's mansion and gave it to them. Yeah. So Kevin, we have a question coming in from the audience in the chat, and I'm gonna ask it in just a moment, but before that, do I understand that regardless of what the federal government's doing, you're telling me the Virginia Indians always honor their treaties? Oh, yeah, absolutely. We always honor our, uh, honor our treaties. They're, they're the ones that broke the treaties. Amen. All right, so here's the other question that came in. It is, talk about the conflict between the Powhatan tribes and the Western tribes, such as the Monacan. So there were clearly some tribal conflicts that had nothing to do with the, the settlers as well. Tell us a little bit about that. Most of it is over um, territory. There was a, um, an anthropologist um, in, I think in the 80s that um, did a study and he looked at all the Indian tribes in Virginia and on the East Coast and he looked at the distance between each tribe and he was trying to figure out how come there's so much distance from one tribe to another. And, and he calculated how many white deer, I mean white-tailed deer were, uh, would be per square mile and calculated how many um, hides a person would need 
each year, you know, for clothing or whatever. And he came up with a formula, and when he, he put that formula in the computer, the, all the Indian villages were at exactly th the same distance um, in his computer that they were in reality. And, and yeah, and so um, he, he believed, and he wrote, a, um, I forget the name of the book in the paper, but that uh, the correlation between the distance between uh, villages was based on the population of the village and the population of the deer between them. So each, each nation or each tribe had uh, protected its, its surroundings because it knew how much land it needed to hunt in order to um, feed, you know, feed their families and keep everybody clothed. And so when one tribe would uh, you know, come too close or they would overhunt their land and hunt on another tribe's land, then that would, and, and, uh, that would result in warfare. And so um, we were fighting for territory, but not, I mean, not just for you know, greed or arrogance. It was for um, food and, uh, and resources. That was most of the of the fights between the the Siouan and the Powhatan tribes of where the um, over resources. So this is just a, a simple question. As you were talking about um, in the beginning, the um, what the Powhatan's living conditions looked like and how the river was so important. Can you tell me what a Three Sisters Garden is? Um, well, thank you for that question. Three Sisters Garden is. Um, is a real staple for all of us, as I said earlier. And up and down the East Coast, um, it's real important. Um, it's corn, squash, and beans. And basically, it's called Three Sisters because the majority of us are matrilineal in our clan systems. And so um, rather than three brothers, it's three sisters. But um, the idea is that you plant the corn first then you plant the beans around it because uh, nobody has time to run out there and stake beans for half the summer. And so what you want is an easy access for the beans to safely grow tall and tendril themselves up around the corn. And then you put the squash on the outside, the, the outside circle, because squash have sticky leaves and are great bug deterrence when you have those crawly naughty boys that have six legs um you know they get ensnared by the the sticky leaves and they're less likely to crawl up for a snack of some delicious beans and some corn um and so that's how three sisters got started um and it's still very traditional um if you go to museum of the american indian um up in dc they aren't able because of the lack of land there and the lack of space to plant an actual Three Sisters garden. But what they have done is they have planted bits and pieces, like they'll have a acorn and beans growing up it and squash around it in one place, and they'll have the same thing sort of replicated around the parameters of the building. Um, but it's nice to see that they paid attention to that and that they're doing that. And um, of course, of course, it's um, nutritionally a complete food source, you know, because beans are protein, uh, corn is complex carbohydrate, um, and these are all heirloom varietals. So they're not, you know, things that make you grow four ears when you eat them. I mean, they're, they're really homogenous to your body. And the squash are the top um, grabber for beta carotene, which you definitely need. So if you eat um, a diet that is complete with those kinds of things, you stand a way better chance of making it to the next century or whatever your goal is. But um, it's, it's very traditional heirloom varietals. We have a lot of people that have saved corn seeds and bean seeds and squash seeds for forever. Um, there's a guy, William Woys Weaver, who's out of Pennsylvania. Um, who is a seed saver and doing publishing books on heirloom varietals. He works with tribes. He works with a lot of people. He has found some very rare corn, very old corn seeds, and they are propagating them. Um, he lives near Philadelphia, but west of Philly. He is doing a lot of amazing things, but all really to benefit our people and to keep the vision going. So it's actually, it's kind of, it's two disparate questions. So the first is, 
you know, how big is the tribe today? And I would also assume there's a much larger circle of folks that are affiliated or related. And then the second question, completely unrelated, is um, if you could talk a little bit about the Kiskiaks at all. Okay. Um, the <clears throat> a Pamunkey tribe, we have, I think it's 410 or 415 enrolled members. Um, our reservation is um, it's about 1,200 acres. Um, it's in King William County, and um, it used to be an island, uh, but then they, um, oh, they brought a railroad in in the 1850s, and it kind of dammed up across, across this marsh, and so it's, it's actually a, p a peninsula now. But in, on the old maps, it was an island, and now there's about, I think, 50 homes on the reservation, 50-some tribal members, and you know, with spouses, there's about 75 people on the reservation now. But... That's just, what is that, 15% that live on the reservation. Most of the people live off the reservation. And we had a, um, a small community in Philadelphia. That's where I was born. Um, for some reason, uh, people from the reservation couldn't get jobs in Richmond, so we w uh, went to Philadelphia. I'm not sure who the first one uh, was that went there, but, but somebody from the reservation went there and got established, and then other people would come up and stay with them and, and live there. And so we... We had a satellite community in um, northern Philadelphia, and it was like like two square blocks that was people from the reservation. Now, the Chickahominy, I'm not sure how, how large the Chickahominy are. I really don't know, but um, you should also talk about Kiskiak. Kiskiak, okay. Yeah. <clears throat> I know Kiskiak, they were, they were one of the uh, 32 tribes in the Confederacy. I don't know that much about what happened to them, I think they were just kind of like the Paspaheg. They say the Paspaheg uh, came up and uh, merged with the Chickahominy. I think the Kiskiak came up and merged with Pamunkey. So um, there was a lot of fighting going on between 1622 and 1644. Um, uh, Opie uh, was our chief, and he fought uh, a 22-year war against the English, and then he was captured and taken Jamestown and, and shot in the back yeah but um, so I think Kiskiak came up um, and merged with Pamunkey and they found the um, they found what they think is the um, is the village there it's, it, it's on a it's on a naval weapons station yeah and they did archaeology there a few years ago I went down there and, and looked at it and it was it was pretty amazing what they what they found at Kiskiak there it was not meant to be a loaded question, but I used to be the CEO of that base, and so I knew they were doing a lot of research on the Kiskiaks underneath the houses that are built right on the Colonial Parkway. It was really cool. The, the big industry there was oysters. They, those oyster beds there date back thousands of years. That the, they used to load oysters in dugout canoes and take them all the way up to the fall line and then, um, I guess, backpack them from there, but, but they found uh, Chesapeake Bay oysters up, up in, the, in the Blue Ridge Mountains. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know what happened to the town that you're talking about um, where they did the digging and the examining, but it was, um, the people must have met with some really horrible things because there's a lot of um, spiritual unrest in that area. And uh, some of the archaeologists who were there were... Um, I don't want to say attacked, but they were kind of put upon by this this juju that was present from from the deaths, and they were obviously horrible deaths. And I I, I think that as spiritual people, we have to understand that that that's just as real as you know angels and archangels and all the company of heaven. I mean, you have to understand that where you have the presence of good, you have the presence of evil, and a, a lot of horrendous things happen to native people um in and you just you don't know because this was of course after the settler people had come so maybe they didn't they didn't take part in that but a lot of stuff was fostered or encouraged in order to move people along so that people could roll in and do whatever it was that they thought they wanted to do so i know that Kiskiak is a place that has always stood out in my mind 
um, as one of those places. And I know one of the one of the people that was in the archaeological team um, came to me and asked me if I would pray with them because they were so tormented. And um, I, I was kind of shocked at first, but then I, I kind of said, yeah, I get that. No, I get that. Um, I do understand that. So uh, it was not a real pretty situation there towards the end. This is a question from online. For Kevin, what was the biggest challenge you faced as chief? Well, uh, the biggest challenge was federal recognition. Uh, getting everybody's birth certificate, because I had to get um, everybody's birth certificate together. And uh, for some reason, nobody likes to look up their birth certificate, because it's always in like a footlocker, or you put it away somewhere, you don't know where it is. You don't feel like messing around with it. And I had to just go around and constantly harass people. I need your birth certificate. Well, I didn't get a chance to look for it yet. I'll look for it next week. And then next week would come, and I'd, uh, I'd go back to him. Again. I said, I need it again. They said, oh, but I haven't gotten a chance. I know it's up in the attic somewhere. And so um, eventually I just, I just got our attorneys to um, f fill out uh, some paperwork, and we filed it with the, um, with the health department, and it gave me the authority and permission to go up to the Bureau of Vital S Statistics and just apply for other people's birth certificates because they just wouldn't, wouldn't do it for some reason. So I'd go to the health department and get in line and I had a, a letter and it was, it was cleared by the attorney general's office. And so um, I had to actually get about one third of the birth certificates myself uh, from everybody. And um, so we used that. And one of the other things that we found with ones that were born at the early part of the century, uh, we had midwives and they didn't go to the hospital. So they had no birth certificate. And so uh, we were trying to figure out what we could do to um, you know, get around that, and uh, we found death certificates. A death certificate has the same amount of information on it that your birth certificate does. So uh, we got the Bureau of Indian Affairs, and they never did this before, we got them to accept a death certificate as if it was a birth certificate, because we didn't have everybody's birth certificate. And so that was one of the um, hard things to do, is, is try to get death certificates from people. And also we got um, viewing books and uh, that you sign in at someone's viewing. And we use that for uh, tribal membership too. And we use that for what they call um, a unique, um, a separate and unique community. And so we, um, we took names off of viewings and uh, correlated them to the, um, the tribal role. And we could um, prove to the Bureau of Indian Affairs that, that we weren't just a group of people who happened to live in the same area. We were a tribe because when somebody died, tribal members from, you know, Pennsylvania would w would come back uh, f for the funeral, and that normally doesn't happen in a s in a small country town. And so we used all those uh, all those different ways to uh, document our existence over 400 years, and that's what mostly I did, and that was what you know what's kind of driving us crazy, just trying to get um, everybody's documentation at that time we had 208 members now we're up to 400 and some yeah okay yeah we're talking about <clears throat> um a funeral viewing and the uh, the book that you sign when you come to the viewing and we pulled a lot of it. that's how we would uh, know oftentimes who who were um you know the extended family and who were other tribal members that, that lived in the area who had moved off. And so we used those names. We tr transcribed all those names and put them together as tribal membership roles. Yeah. All right. We're, we're getting close to a full hour here. So one more question from the audience. And then I'd like to ask each of you for a parting word. So the, the audience also asked, what was your greatest joy in your time as a chief? And then for, for each of you, you've shared so much information with us. Would you just tell those in the audience as well as the young folks here, if they only remember one thing from today, what do you want them to take away from having met you and heard from you today? Uh, there's an old schoolhouse on the reservation, and it's the, um, it's the oldest one-room schoolhouse in King William County, and it had it up, and I got a, uh, a local um, a uh, wealthy landowner in the area to um, uh, send his partners down to do some of the 
for the structural work. And, and uh, volunteers from the Peace Corps, I've seen this, a lot of them were from Norfolk and, and uh, over here, too. And, and they came hands and knees and scrubbed and painted and, and we refinished stuff. But we, um, we fixed up this old schoolhouse and brought it back up to, uh, you know, conditions like it was back in the 1900s. And, and it's still on the reservation. It's, it's, um, it's part of the museum that we have uh, on the reservation. It's right next to the Monkey Museum. So you should all go up there and check it out sometime. Original black slate school boards, blackboards, uh, original wainscoting, um, original gingerbread and dentalium all around the ceiling. The original windows, the original glass windows are there because the teachers had the sense not to let the kids play baseball. She made them play croquet. And so <laughs> unless you're Pot Shot Charlie, you're not breaking any windows. Um, so just an amazing place. But you go in and you just feel the history there and you're just awed that a school could be that beautiful and that pristine. And you just celebrate that this is the oldest standing Indian schoolhouse in, in the whole area. And it's like amazing. And I've taken lots of students there and they're just drop jawed. You know, they just can't even believe it. It's just such a, a testimony to the native way because there was no money given by the state for that school to be built. They said, you want a school, baby? You build it yourself. We'll pay for the teacher. Well, fat chance. Okay, that's just great. So there were enough artisans and craftsmen and Pamunkey Nation who said, mm hmm we can do this. And they didn't just do it. They did it Cadillac fashion. So it's this gorgeous school. And you need to treat yourself and go up there and just take a gander. You'll, you'll be shocked. All right, well, let's say parting words. Um, I would say like St. John Paul, uh, the 23rd, that the major thing is love. Love is really it. Uh, when you find yourself bristling like a porcupine, shed your quills and believe in love. Especially love people for their differences. I love them for their things that are the same that you have. And if you have nothing in common, uh, nothing the same, just love them because you can't give, out, get, give God and you can't outgive love. Well, the chaplain uh, uh, said something to me in, um, earlier. It kind of rings true. A lot of people, when I go somewhere to a, to a school or something, they, uh, they say, oh, it's so cool you're from a tribe. I wish I was from a tribe. But um, if you go back far enough, everybody is, is tribal. If, whether you're from you know, France, uh, the uh, Salutrian tribes and, and Celtic tribes in the uh, uh, British Isles and um, all over the world, um, we're all tribal. We all have traditions. So we just, some of us just don't have to go back so far. So, but um, everybody can do it now and, and research your background, your tribe. And uh, yeah, we're all related. Yeah. Yan Yameha. Well, we're so fortunate, so blessed that Nellie and Kevin gave us some of their time. Uh, Nellie, would you just tell us what you ended with there? What was that word you said to us at the end? Nawe, thank you. Uh, well, Nawe to both of you as well, right? Thank you so much, everybody. Yeah, that way. I uh, just want to say, uh, on behalf of the parents of the breach of the diocese, I'm glad we were to have both of you here with us, and that you should, if you are part of our diocese, keep an eye out for other diocesan preparers of the breach coming up. Other programs will include and lead up to uh, a major event that we will be holding on um, October 29th. That will be a launch of the Matoka Covenant. So keep an eye out in the tidings and other places to hear more about that and keep an eye out for other programs. Now we have a lot of youth with us. There are also a lot of other youth programs coming up in the diocese. One of them will be summer camp here at Shanko. I'm going to invite Megan to come up and just say another word about any other youth programs that she might be putting on for the kids in the diocese. Um, yeah, thank you all um, so much. We are so glad that you guys were able
able to join us. Um, our theme this weekend was um, the upside down kingdom of God and um, sometimes how the human world doesn't always reflect that. And so the USA board brought us together and right now um, as the school year comes to a close, we are looking for new UIC board members. We will be doing um, applications and interviews again here soon. Um, the board plans these events. We do an event in the fall and in the spring. Um, and so we are looking forward to um, coming back um, as we're dealing with that. So um, keep, keep an eye out for these events again, one in the fall and one in the spring. Thanks a lot, Megan, really appreciate that. I'm gonna ask Kevin to sneak back up here for one more minute. Uh, one of the things that we like to do is to thank our guests for their presentation. And so uh, we'll be sending a, a monetary thank you to each of these folks, just a little honorarium to say thank you so much for what they've done for us. But additionally, the Diocese of Southern Virginia is pretty pleased to be able to be the current stewards of this piece of land, this piece of God's creation that we were not the original stewards of, nor might we be the last? It's hard to know what time will bring. But a couple small gifts from this land to Kevin to honor him. Uh, we're, a, we're a habitat for bald eagles and a bald eagle feather for you that you can use in your regalia or wherever else you might want. And then uh, Chesapeakean Jessup Jefferson, it's the fossil of our state and you can find them along the beach here. And we wanna honor you with both of those pieces of this land uh, so that you can take that piece back home with you. So thank you both very much. Thank you all for attending. Everybody have a good night, and I'll ask Ben to stop recording and sign off.